Hello, and welcome to the diagnosis specific education session, chronic granulatomous disease. My name is Felicia Morton, and I'm the executive director of the CGD Association of America. I will be the moderator for this session. Before we begin, please remember that each individual's treatment and condition is unique. The information presented during the session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Questions about this topic will be answered at the end of the presenter's talk. Please submit your questions to me, Felicia Morton, via the chat box. The presenter will answer as many questions as possible during the session time. At this time, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenters, Dr. Jennifer Lighting and Dr. Rebecca Marsh. Dr. Jennifer Lighting is an associate professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology Department of Pediatrics at the University of South Florida and John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Dr. Marsh is professor at the University of Cincinnati and works in the division at Bone Marrow and Immunodeficiency Program, the clinical director of HLH Center for Excellence and the clinical immunodeficiency fellowship program director and co-director of the Diagnostic Immunological Laboratory. We are honored to have both of you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. We're also looking yes. forward to this. Yes, thank you, Felicia. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute myself. <laughs> and, uh, but thank you for having us. And um, I think Dr. Marsh and I are both excited to speak together. It's not often that we get to do that. So um, thank you for getting for putting us together too. It'll be fun. So with that, I am first up, I'm going to get started. So I'm um, kicking off our session and going to be talking about CGD. Uh, just a, a bit of background, history, diagnosis, and some expectations for patients. Um, and it's really just meant to be the groundwork for Dr. Marsh's talk, where she's going to talk a little bit more about um, the cutting edge treatments available for CGD, including bone marrow transplantation and um, gene therapy. I have a couple of disclosures. Um, the first really is not relevant, but the second is I am a speaker, consultant, and receive grant research from Horizon Therapeutics. Um, which manufactures interferon gamma, many of uh, which uh, yourselves or your family members may be receiving as therapy for CGD. So I always like to start um, my um, CGD talks about just really kind of um, with a sense of hope and inspiring folks about how far we've come in this field. Um, CGD used to be called a fatal granulomatous disease of childhood. I think many of us can argue that although children and adults still can die of CGD, it is no longer this dismal um, sort of fatal disease um, a diagnosis that, that patients are given. But the first case of CGD was actually um, uh, in the literature by Dr. Good, who was the founder of the division that I'm part of um, in the early 50s and a 12 month old um, child that was cared for in Minnesota. And you can see in the, the original um, description of this child, they have you know, many of the problems that CGD patients confront even today, including, you know, chronic infections of the lymph nodes and lungs. Um, but again, I just want to sort of start with, although this was a fatal disease now, almost 70 years, I guess, 70 years ago, um, it, it no longer um, really is that. So I'll start with sort of the, the molecular part of the science behind this. I'm just going over um, what CGD is and um, the biology be behind it. So if you um, look at the, um, uh, the slide and imagine that it's one big giant cell. So the circle is just a, a big giant cell. That's gonna be really any immune cell, but most notably for CGD, the, the neutrophil. And then if you consider um, this light blue line, the surface of the phagolysosome, um, that's sort of a compartment within the cell. And the phagolysosome is a um, cellular compartment where certain bacteria and certain fungi are um, dealt with. So the phagolysosome will, will ingest those bacteria and those fungi and um, destroy them and just rid the body of them. So in CGD and in everybody, on the surface of the phagolysosome, this complex comes together. It's not sitting 
already put together. Um, it is just, you know, sort of uh, comes together when the cell is stimulated. So the NADPH complex is comprised of all of these proteins um, that make up what the NADPH complex does, which ultimately is the contribution of an electron molecule across this phagolysosome surface leading to the production of superoxide or oxygen radicals. We also call this reactive oxygen species. It has like five different names, but it's all the same thing, which is superoxide inside the phagolysosome, which, which is what provides the killing activity of these bacteria and fungi. So in CGD, any of these proteins or the genes that encode them are mutated, which leads to the loss of function of this complex. So how do patients present with, with CGD? So there's a variety of presentations and this list is getting longer and longer and I'm certainly not comprehensive here, but this is the sort of most common things. The first, and I think most of you probably have experienced or seen, is recurrent infections with unusual organisms. So CGD patients have a very narrow spectrum of um, organisms that they are susceptible to. And we will often see infections in, in the body because of those organisms. The other is failure to thrive. So this is in children and failure to thrive is really a, a problem of um, ability to gain weight, ability to develop normally, to gain height um, and really to grow in children and in adults, uh, but most notably in children. Failure to thrive is not specific to CGD. It happens really with any chronic illness. Uh, but it can and often is a presenting symptom in CGD. Another that's being more recognized as time goes by is inflammatory bowel disease. So around 50% of patients um, with CGD can develop problems of the GI tract that mimic inflammatory bowel disease, similar symptoms, sim similar um, pathology and biopsy results. Uh, that look like inflammatory bowel disease, but it also can be a presenting symptom. So a, a child that presents with inflammatory bowel disease, CGD is something we would want to consider diagnostically uh, for that child. Uh, the next is poor wound healing. So um, we have seen patients that just have surgery and, and their wounds are not healing appropriately, and that can be a, a symptom of CGD. Granuloma formation, it is called chronic granulomatous disease because that's a highlight of the disease that we're forming granulomas. A lot of people ask me what granulomas are. Granulomas are basically just a collection of immune cells that don't belong there. So if, for example, if you had a granuloma in the lung, um, it's a collection of different immune cells that have been signaled to come to the lung when they have no business being in the lung. And so that can lead to then obstruction or, um, even destruction of the normal tissue that's in the lung and, and ultimately compromise the function of that lung or whatever, whichever organ is being affected. Um, and lastly is granulomas that lead to obstruction. So just as I just indicated, if you had a granuloma, you can imagine maybe in the bladder that prevented urine from coming out, then you're gonna have some obstruction issue in the bladder that might lead to urinary tract infections or kidney infections or something like that. So the diagnosis of CGD is relatively variable. These numbers are, are actually quite old from the literature, so we're probably not totally accurate, um, but the frequency is some, somewhere between one in 100,000 to one in 200,000. Um, uh, we see the frequency kind of go down or be more common um, in um, uh, areas of the world where there is intermarriage, where the where um, cousins might become married, or in areas of the world where um, there's isolation um, just geographically, so that there might not be as much uh, genetic heterogeneity in that, in that population. Presentation is often almost always in childhood, but there are lots and lots and lots of adult cases being recognized well into the second, third, fourth, even sixth decade of life. We've seen that in some patients. Um, and so it's a diagnosis that needs to be considered no, no matter how old you are. So just a little bit about inheritance. I like to throw this in here just to, to, to explain things to people. And it matters in the case of CGD because we have both X-linked inheritance and autosomal recessive inheritance um, as both, uh, both patterns um, uh, for how CGD can potentially be spread um, from generation to generation within a family. So X-linked inheritance, 
um, is typically passed from, a, un, from an unaffected female, typically the mother, to her sons. And the reason for that is that the X chromosome is one of the chromosomes that defines our sex, whether we're a female or a male. So a female is an XX, she has two X chromosomes, and a male is an XY. So um, XY is what defines um, uh, the male as being male. And so um, when the female has a, has a mutated X chromosome, she is not necessarily gonna be affected. I don't like that it says unaffected here because in the case of CGD, we do know that female carriers are, can be affected and I'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> but at any rate, they are um, typically do not have the disease uh, full blown. And so uh, that mother can then pass the mutated X onto her son who does not have an additional X uh, to, um, sorry, sons over here, have an additional X to, to balance out that mutated X. And so he would have CGD. She could also potentially pass that X, that mutated X onto her daughter, who would then also become a carrier and would have the same risk as she does when that daughter goes to have children. Autosomal recessive inheritance is different in the sense that both parents are often carriers of the disease and they pass the mutated gene to their offspring and those children that they have, it doesn't matter whether they are a female or a male, the risk is the same. And so that risk would be 25% with each pregnancy. Um, and in the X-linked inheritance pattern, the risk is really only to the boys that are born of having that disease. Uh, there is risk obviously to the females of becoming a carrier, but not of actually having the disease itself. Okay, so in types of CGD, the X-linked type is around, uh, the frequency is around 70%, and the, the gene that's associated with that is CYBB. Um, the and, the, and again, there's female carriers, which I'll get into in a, in a few minutes. The recessive type of CGD, um, the gene that's associated with it is NCF1 is the most common. It happens in about 20% of patients, followed by these others that are um, more rare. It's all actually quite interesting. The majority of patients who have mutations in NCF1 have the same two base pair deletion. Um, it's a very, very common mutation in this gene. And being a carrier for that two base pair deletion is about one in 250, which is actually pretty common in the population. So I have a feeling we're probably underdiagnosing CGD because of the likelihood of being a carrier for this particular mutation. So how do we diagnose um, uh, CGD? So we used to use something called the nitro blue tetrazoleum test or the NBT. Um, this has fallen out of favor for a variety of reasons, uh, but just to walk you through it, because many of you may have had this test done historically. Um, if you look in the middle panel, this is normal. This is what neutrophils should do, um, which is that they, um, when they are exposed to a reagent, they, the color changes when superoxide is made and they turn this black color. And you can see that under the microscope. When you have a CGD patient, <coughs> excuse me, who has no superoxide production or very little, then there will be no color change. And then if you look at a female carrier, they're gonna have roughly 50% of their X chromosomes that are normal and 50% that are abnormal, roughly. Now that ratio can change over time. Um, and that's a concept called lionization. But you can see in this particular slide, there's about half of the neutrophils that look normal where they have the color change and half that do not. So the reason we don't use this test anymore is because it's completely qualitative. It doesn't tell us anything about um, the genetics of CGD. And it also has, relies on a human being looking through a microscope and making a determination. And so that's you know just fraught with error. And there have been lots of cases that have been missed because of uh, MBT being the only form of diagnosis. So now what we use is something called the dihydrorhodamine assay. The DHR is actually very similar to the NBT in the sense that you use an instrument to isolate neutrophils. This instrument's called the flow cytometer. Um, you, is you isolate granulocytes or neutrophils, you stimulate them with the same type of stimulant, you tag them with a fluorescent tag, and then the machine um, detects which cells are fluorescing. And the fluorescence indicates the degree of um, superoxide that's being generated. So you, this is a report that you might see. So in a normal patient, um, you will see this peak move over time and, be, and fluoresce, and that's consistent with just normal superoxide production. 
In a in an excellent CGD patient, there might be very little fluorescence, and so this peak would not uh, move to the right. Um, in a recessive patient, you, you usually have some superoxide production, and so there might be a little bit of a peak. <clears throat> and just like the MBT and excellent carriers, you will have two peaks um, if um, if the DHR, um, or I'm sorry, if the patient is an X-linked carrier, you'll have the, the normal peak that moves and then the mutated peak that uh, isn't moving with time and is uh, not fluorescing, uh, indicating loss of superoxide production. So a little bit about carriers of X-linked CGD. So you saw, um, uh, you know, the, just the DHR to reiterate that. <laughs> so we know just from the literature, excuse my cough, I've been talking all day, that's my problem. Um, there is, we know that carriers have um, a higher frequency of discoid lupus, mouth ulcers, and joint pain, but from the Marciano paper from the NIH that came out a few years ago, we were able to show that DHR uh, status or the amount of superoxide that a female makes very much correlates with her infection susceptibility. So when that amount falls below about 20%, the likelihood of getting infections related to CGD goes up um, uh, quite high. Whereas um, the uh, other features, the autoimmune, the discoid type, discoid lupus features and all these other sorts of symptoms really do, do not correlate with the DHR. <clears throat> so um, you can see that in, in carriers, it's, it's a little bit different than it is in patients. And so I wanted to give a shout out at this point, you know, Felicia Morton, who introduced us as the president um, of this uh, CGD association, has been very involved with CGD advocacy and patients through the IDF and also through her, through her own foundation. And uh, recently, we put out a survey in collaboration with the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, both of whom uh, Dr. Marsh and I are members of, and have collected data on um, clinical status of X-linked carriers. And so we've, we've actually, I'm sure many of you who've completed the survey are hopefully listening in right now, um, but we successfully uh, received 133 surveys and we're in the process of analyzing that data now. So hopefully this time next year, we'll be able to share all of the different um, self-reported clinical uh, manifestations that carriers have. So a little bit about infections. Oh, I'm sorry, the slide kind of, um, skewed, it's probably a MAC issue. <clears throat> but the infections that CGD patients have are primarily with bacteria and fungus. They do not have major problems with viruses. Um, and their infections primarily hit um, uh, certain areas of the body and it is based on the organism that they're infected with. So these are the five most common organisms that we see in North America. Um, several are bacteria and then Aspergillus is a fungus. And like I said, certain bacteria, certain fungi like to go to certain places. So for example, um, Staph aureus tends to like the liver, the lymph nodes, Serratia tends to like the bone. Again, sorry that it's out of whack on the slide. Burkholderia tends to like the lung or the blood. And so those organisms can be um, you know, found more commonly in those locations when a patient is infected. So a little, a few pictures of granulomatous complications. These are old pictures from old uh, manuscripts, but they still tell the story. And you can see in patients with CGD, the esophageal strictures that can happen. This is a picture of an esophagus. It really should look like a straight pipe, like a garden hose. And you can see all of the um, um, strictures that have happened really from inflammation within the esophagus. This is also, uh, this right slide is gastric outlet obstruction. So this is the stomach. <clears throat> and the stomach, this dye that's inside the stomach should be emptying into the small intestine. And you can see that it comes to this like pointed area where it's just closed off because of obstruction. Below are the kidneys and the bladder. Um, you can see um, throughout all three images, this dilatation of the kidneys. This is, you may just have to trust me on it, but this is just dilation of the pelvises within the kidney and then in, in panel B, dilation of the ureter. And this happens because the plumbing of the bladder is just backed up. And that happens because of granuloma formation inside the bladder. So I touched on inflammatory bowel disease. It's a complication of about 50% of patients. Unfortunately, there is no specific symptom to CGD that helps us distinguish this. Um, uh, the symptoms that overlap with Crohn's disease or other types of inflammatory bowel disease are, are very similar, including chronic abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, um, et cetera. 
how do we manage CGD? So um, prophylactic antibiotics and antifungals. Um, this is daily prophylaxis with Septra or Bactrim is typically our agent of choice. There are some alternatives for people who have allergies, but this is going to be our go-to. And then itraconazole or another antifungal agent that covers aspergillus like itraconazole does. So those other agents include things like voriconazole or posaconazole. Um, that are agents that we will use as prophylaxis. And then lastly is prophylactic interferon gamma, um, which is uh, FDA approved um, for the indication of prevention of infections in CGD patients. And then there's this constant aggressive search and treatment of infections. So when I see my CGD patients, it's this sort of constant high, heightened suspicion that somebody might have an infection. I have to always be sort of looking for it. Um, and making sure that I'm not missing it. So how do we monitor for infections? Patients need to be followed with an immunologist or a physician that has expertise in CGD. Sometimes that's an infectious disease doctor or a hem Ooh, I'm sorry, or a hematologist oncologist, um, but they need to be following regularly with that doctor even when they're well. Um, we often are doing tests looking for evidence of infection, and this can be as simple as elevated inflammatory markers, which can happen in the presence of infection. We may want to do routine imaging as it pertains to specific symptoms. So for example, if a patient's had a liver abscess in the past, well, we're going to want to image the abdomen uh, more frequently in the future, just to ensure that a, a second abscess hasn't formed uh, much later. And then treatment is often prolonged and usually IV. So when a patient gets an infection, there's, there is going to be this expectation that there needs to be a prolonged treatment course, or there should be that expectation, I should say. Um, so again, expectations, this close follow-up with a physician, uh, taking medications every day to prevent infections. It's really important to be compliant with that. There's going to be frequent labs and radiography based on history. By frequent, I, you know, that's really dictated by your specific physician, but also uh, the symptoms that you've had. When infections are present, we often need to do invasive procedures to try to identify that organism. So that might be a bronchoscopy, which is a, a procedure that goes into the lungs and gets um, fluid from the lungs to look for whatever organism might be causing the pneumonia. And then you may get a referral for bone marrow transplantation as a curative form of therapy. Um, or more definitive form of therapy for CGD. And I am done. So I am happy to take any questions at this point. I'll also remain on when Dr. Marsh is completed and we can both answer questions. And Thank you so much, Dr. Lighting. That was wonderful. Do you know, I had no idea that NCF carrier rate was one in 250 actually. Yeah, it's pretty high. Um, that's remarkable. Well, again, I'm Rebecca Marsh. I'm actually in Cincinnati, and I'm an immunologist and also a bone marrow transplant physician. So I'm going to talk to you today about allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant or bone marrow transplant for CGD. I'm also going to highlight a little bit on gene therapy for CGD, and then actually refer you on to a recorded talk from last year that's fantastic, that for those of you who really want to delve a little more into gene therapy, you can view. So first, why does a transplant work? So basically everyone has stem cells in the bone marrow and those stem cells make all of your other blood cells and immune system cells. And so as you can see in the picture, you have a happy little stem cell sitting here and it's making your red cells, your natural killer cells, your T cells, and also importantly, your monocytes and your neutrophils. And so when we do a bone marrow transplant, we basically replace a patient's broken stem cells with normal stem cells from a healthy donor. And when we do that, those healthy stem cells then make healthy, normal neutrophils. And so that's why we can replace someone's stem cells with a bone marrow transplant and theoretically fix the problem that they have so that they are no longer experiencing chronic granulomatous related disease problems like infections and IBD and all the things that come with a diagnosis of CGD. Now, there are many steps to doing a transplant and I will preface this talk by saying it is a high risk procedure. We will talk about survival a little bit later in the talk, but it is an undertaking. And so as Dr. Lighting mentioned, you may receive a referral to a transplant physician and you're gonna be developing a very close relationship with your transplant physician just as you have with your immunology physician, because it's a long process and there are a lot of steps. 
And so today we're gonna to talk about what are the steps to doing a bone marrow transplant. And basically five big steps are number one, to identify a patient at need. And so this is most patients with chronic craniolomatous disease can be considered for a bone marrow transplant. Now, once you've decided a patient needs one or should consider one, you then have to find a donor. You have to have someone who's a good match that's able to give stem cells to that patient. Number three, and we'll talk about a little bit later, you have to give some conditioning. So just like when you plant a garden in your backyard, you cannot just go out and plant tomato seeds and potato seeds and have it grow. You have to make the soil ready. You have to kill the weeds. You have to till the soil. You have to make it ready. And we do that for transplant by giving conditioning. Number four, you have to give a stem cell graft. So new stem cells from a donor. And then number five is the most important. You have to wait for the patient to recover and you have to wait for those stem cells to turn into a new immune system. So first step, who to transplant? In some cases, this is extremely straightforward. So let's say you have a healthy six month old baby with CGD who is diagnosed because they had a family history of people being affected by CGD. And this patient happens to have a perfectly healthy matched brother who's a donor who's unaffected by CGD. That is a pretty straightforward scenario for a transplant and immunology physician to decide, yes, we should consider transplant for this patient. On the other hand, if you have a nine-year-old patient who has CGD and they only have a seven out of 10 mismatched donor, that means this patient has a much higher risk of developing complications of transplant, including graft versus host disease. And in this case, we might not think about doing a transplant because the risk is higher. And we might think about, do we do it in a special way that we prevent the graft versus host disease? And we're getting better and better at doing haploidentical transplants. And what that means is that doing a transplant using a parent as a donor who's only a half match, or do we potentially refer this patient to a specialist in gene therapy to see if they're a candidate for gene therapy? So it's not an easy question to answer all the time. It's very patient specific. Now, step two, we have to find an appropriate donor. So you can't do a transplant if you don't have a good donor. Ideally, we will find a 10 out of 10 or 12 out of 12 HLA matched related or unrelated donor. And for those of you who have been through a transplant or are considering a transplant, you're familiar with these terms. But what is HLA typing? So the human leukocyte antigen system is a group of related cell surface proteins that function in your body to present what we call antigens to T cells. And this is way your body keeps you healthy. Your body presents things to the immune system to let your immune system know if they're doing okay and healthy or if they're infected with something and need some help with the immune system. And we try to match those HLA proteins between patients and donors because if those things are different, the immune system is very smart and it will recognize that they are different. And if the cells from a donor recognize a patient as being different, they will think there's a problem and they will think that there's an infection or some other problem and they will start to attack that patient. And that's what causes graft versus host disease. And so we try to make the donor and the patient as similar as possible with regard to the HLA system. And you can see a nice picture here that I stole from Wikipedia um, that details where the HLA alleles are all located. And so these are where all these genes are on your HLA roadmap. And these are the things we're looking at basically to try to match up sequences of HLA alleles between a patient and a donor. Now, what is the chance that a sibling is a match? It's just like autosomal recessive inheritance of diseases like CGD because you get half of your HLA haplotype from your dad and half of it from your mom. And so you, so you can see in the picture here, this patient got this yellow HLA haplotype from dad. They got this green one from mom. And so this is this child's particular HLA typing. And you can see in all of the siblings, if there are four other children, one in four of them just by chance should have the same inheritance of these same two 
um, haplotypes, whereas the other children will not be a match. So for siblings in general, it's about a 25% chance to be a match. And each parent should only be about a half match. Sometimes because certain HLA alleles are super common in the general population, a parent might be like a six out of 10 instead of a five out of 10, but in general, parents are only a half match. Now, what if there isn't a matched donor? We may consider a mismatched or a haploidentical transplant. And again, haploidentical just means a half match. This is usually a parent. It could also be a sibling who's only a half match, but most often it's a parent. These types of transplants require a little bit of a special approach. We need to take additional measures to prevent the graft versus host disease from happening and also to prevent rejection. This means we might be giving more of certain medicines called alemtuzumab or ETG. And these are therapies that can really help prevent rejection and graft versus host disease. We may be processing the stem cells from the donor in a special way that we take the T cells out of that graft. And the T cells really contribute to the graft versus host disease. And so if we can just take the T cells out, then that's gonna decrease the risk of graft versus host disease. We may also give something called post-transplant cyclophosphamide. And cyclophosphamide is a very special chemotherapy that's very good at targeting immune system cells that are very activated. And after transplant, T cells from a donor may become very angry and start to cause graft versus host disease. But if we give cyclophosphamide at the right time, we can greatly inhibit and even kill those T cells so that we can tolerate more of a mismatched donor for a successful transplant. Now, what's the chance of finding at least a seven out of eight match. This is older data, but I still include it to show that the chance of finding at least a seven out of eight unrelated donor depends on your ethnicity. In Caucasian patients, we have a very good chance of finding a suitable donor for transplant, but in all of our minority populations, it is harder to find a good match simply because there are fewer minorities in their registries. And so especially for minority populations, it's really important to try to increase the number of donors who are in the registries. Now, if we had more time today, I would let you all play a game today and I would make you help um, pick a donor for a patient. We don't have time today, so I'm just gonna walk you through this, but what you can see on the screen, this is the report we get back. And I'm sorry, this is a little fuzzy. I need to make a better picture but this is the report we get back. And when you do HLA typing, it's actually incredibly complex because they basically sequence every HLA allele and it has a numbering system. And that numbering system is very complex. But for simple transplanters like myself, it becomes very easy. It's like a matching game. And what you're looking for, for a patient to have a matched either related or unrelated donor, you're just looking for these numbers to be the same. Because if the numbers are the same, that means those HLA alleles are the same and that's a match. And so what you can see for this patient here, this HLA A allele, they have 2301 and 0201. And if you look down here with this unrelated donor has an 0201 and a 2301. And you can do the same for each of these. And what you will see is that each of these numbers is the same. And so this is what we're doing when you hear that we're doing a bone marrow donor search. We're searching through lots of registry records through the NMDP and other registry sources and databases. And we're trying to find people that match up in their HLA typing. And when we do, we know that that's a suitable donor for a transplant. Now, after we have a patient, after we found a donor, now we're gonna get down to business. And what do we have to do to do a transplant? We have to give conditioning. And there's two different things you have to give as part of your conditioning regimen. The first one is called serotherapy. And these things always go together just like peanut butter and chocolate. But your serotherapy are things like antithymocyte globulin, which is ATG, or alemtuzumab, which is also called Campath. These medicines are antibody medicines, they're not chemo. They're antibodies that actually destroy T cells and other immune system cells. And that helps prevent rejection of the graft 
and also helps prevent graft-versus-host disease. Now, in addition to that, we have to give chemotherapy. When you're talking to your transplant centers, these are things like busulfan, melphalan, fludarabine, biotipa. These are more common chemotherapies that we use in patients with CGD. This is how you make room in the bone marrow, similar to how you would make room in your backyard for a garden. The chemotherapy kills the stem cells in the bone marrow. And once that happens, there's now a home available for the new stem cells to go to, take up residence and live hopefully forever and make new cells that work normally. Now, this is a very common question and it does not have an easy answer. How do you pick a conditioning regimen? I usually talk about this in the sense of bakeries because I love cake and everybody loves cake. But picking a transplant conditioning regimen is sort of like bakeries because every transplant center typically has their own special recipe for conditioning. And sometimes that's for historic reasons. Sometimes that's because of new innovations that have come along at that particular center. But every transplant center will maybe do the transplant a little bit differently. And that doesn't mean that anyone is more right or wrong than the other. It just means that they're different. And so just like you might really love the chocolate cake at a bakery in Chicago, you might really like the rainbow cake at a bakery in New York. And it's sort of that same thing. Now, with that being said, for disorders like chronic granulomatous disease where you want the myeloid engraftment, and myeloid means neutrophils and monocytes. These are the cells that are broken in CGD. And so we really need good myeloid engraftment. We prefer in general, what's called reduced toxicity myeloablative preparative regimens. And so a lot of transplant centers have recipes for this type of transplant. So they are not quite as strong as for people with leukemia, basically. Now, step four, once we've given conditioning, we're gonna harvest the stem cells. Now these might be from the bone marrow where we take a needle, very large one, and we put it into someone's hip bones and we take bone marrow out. It might be from cord blood that's harvested from babies after they're born from the umbilical cord. Or it might be what we call peripheral blood stem cells. And when we take peripheral blood stem cells, we hook patients up to a special machine with two very large IVs and we can actually filter out stem cells from the peripheral blood over several hours. Any of these stem cells will work. Now there are pros and cons to each type. Bone marrow cells offer sort of standard graft versus host disease risk. There is sedation required for the donor. They generally go to the operating room, they put to sleep. Peripheral blood stem cells, these are nice because you can get really large cell doses and we like that sometimes. The donor also does not have to have any sedation. So you might consider it to be a little safer for the donor because there's no anesthesia. There is a little bit more risk of chronic GVHD for the patient. Cord blood is nice because it's already been banked. So it's very fast to obtain. You don't have to clear a donor. You don't have to make sure they're healthy. There's no OR procedures, things like this. Cord blood is already banked in a bank. Simply order it and it will come. You can get away with more mismatching with cord blood. It does take longer to engraft because the cell doses are lower. And because the cell doses are lower, you can't always use this for larger or older patients. Now, step five is relatively easy. Infuse the stem cells. They usually go in just like a blood transfusion or sometimes the products are very small if they've been processed and comes in a little syringe, you just push them in. And then step six is the hardest, you have to wait. Um, and the neutrophils tend to come in around two weeks after transplant, but the other pieces of the immune system also have to recover after transplant. And that actually takes many months. And really your whole immune system isn't quite all back to normal until generally about a year after transplant. So there are a lot of precautions in the first six months after transplant as far as limiting exposures and staying isolated. Now, what can go wrong? Lots of things. Biggest barriers really remain graft failure, infections, toxicities, graft versus host disease, and then there are late effects as well. Now I'm gonna spend just a minute or two talking about survival. The bottom line is that for 
transplant for CGD for all comers survival is about 80%. And the survival rates go up and down depending on the age, HLA match, pre-existing complications and other factors. So really as patients, I encourage you, you need to be having in-depth discussions with your transplant doctor. There's no talk that can tell you, you know, what the pros and cons on for your individual approach. Now, this is data from 2013 from our European colleagues. And what you can see, this is a survival curve. This is the percentage of patients surviving on the y-axis. This is just time on the x-axis. And so you can see the survival long-term is a little more than 80% in this data set. This was a PIDTC effort that Jennifer Lighting led with us. You can see that about 80% of patients are surviving at five years. This is another data set from the CIBMTR. These patients were transplanted between 2010, 2016. Again, if you look at this line, it's about 80%. And then here, this is a really large group of patients, more than 700 patients transplanted in Europe with chronic granulomatous disease. And you can see overall 85% survival. The younger you are, you tend to do better post-transplant because you've had less problems develop over time. And also, as you guys know, babies and young children just recover so quickly from many things compared to when you get older. Um, and donor type as well makes a big difference. So you can see here, these are matched sibling donors and they have about a 90% survival at three years. Whereas if you don't have a perfectly matched donor, your survival is a little bit lower at 76%. But overall, in general, survival is good at 80%, but that does mean, unfortunately, that means there's about a 20% risk of a bad outcome. And so we still have a lot of work to do to make things better. Now, gene therapy, I don't have time to talk a lot about, but I wanna mention it. Gene therapy is a research basis therapy, and gene therapy is really a way to take stem cells from a patient fix the broken gene, and then give them their own cells back. And so the benefit of this is that there's no risk of graft versus host disease. Early efforts were complicated by risk of developing leukemia because the process of fixing the broken genes can unfortunately sometimes turn cancer genes on by mistake. Now, this risk has gone way down and it's really, really low now with the use of more recent advanced viral vectors. And the process of this is really similar to a transplant in the sense that you collect bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cells, but you take them from the patient themselves, not from a donor. You then work with the cells in the lab to use a viral vector that's able to insert a good copy of the gene into the patient's stem cells. You still give the patient a little bit of chemotherapy because you have to make room in the bone marrow for their own cells to come back. You infuse those stem cells with the fixed gene and then hopefully they take up residence and grow and start making normal cells. Now I'm gonna go over some recent results that were published in 2020 by all of our gene therapy colleagues. And they basically treated nine patients. Two of them unfortunately died very early from pre-existing problems and we're not gonna focus on those two patients. But of the seven patients that survived, six of them had stable amounts of working gene-corrected cells. And so when you saw the nice pictures from Dr. Lighting looking at the DHR test, what you can see here is that most patients had 16 to 46% of oxidase-positive neutrophils. And we think your risk of infection really only exists below 10% or even up to maybe 20%. So what this means is that six out of seven patients, you know, seem to be fixed for all intents and purposes by the gene therapy. But obviously there's this one patient that it was not successful in. And so six of these patients were able to come off of their Bactrim and their itraconazole and other things. For more information about gene therapy, I would really refer you to this talk that you can find on the IDF website by Dr. Carolyn Kuo, who's a fantastic gene therapy researcher and clinician. And I would really refer you here to this talk. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen in a timely manner. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. And thank you so much, Dr. Lighting. Uh, we really appreciate your talks. And now we're opening up 
our session to the Q&A. And uh, we have gotten some questions. And so I'll start with uh, one of the first ones, which is would cord blood from a related donor, such as an uncle, be a good option? Yeah, as long as the uncle is a match and not affected by CGD, and if the weight of the patient, the size of the actual patient is small enough that the cell dose is good. Um, cord blood is a good option from family members in general. Just sometimes you have to be wary about the cell dose. Sometimes we'll have a patient that we might use the cord blood plus also harvest a bone marrow product so that we're able to give enough. So without knowing the cell dose, I can't say for sure, but in general, yes, it's worth considering depending on the cell dose and the match and all those things. Okay, and uh, oh, there's a clarification on the question. Um, uh, the uh, question was, uh, would it be okay uh, to use um, the parent's brother's child? Uh, for as a donor. Uh, so, so the, the person who's asking has a, has, um, a child uh, with a CGD and they're wondering if she could use her brother's, um, uh, I think, a child's cord blood. So a cousin, is this a cousin? I, I, yes, it's a cousin. But <laughs> yes, so, yes. A, a cousin and also an uncle, by the way, will typically not be a full match. Um, okay. And so you'd really have to look at the HLA typing and talk to your transplant physician because the way the inheritance of the HLA haplotypes work, each parent's going to be just a half match, and any uncle is probably going to be, you know, a half match or less, just like a quarter match um, or even not. And so you'd really have to look at the typing. In general, that cousin is not gonna be a match at all and it's not gonna be usable. Now in families where there's consanguinity, so like um, in families where first cousins have married or other things like this, when there's consanguinity, you can look in the extended family typing and you may be able to find a match because of that consanguinity. But in families where there's not that, typically a cousin will not be a match and neither will an uncle. But related cord bloods, if there is a match, you know, the cord bloods are worth looking at for sure. Thank you for um, answering that question. Um, another question is, could you tell us the difference um, between a nodule and a granuloma? Oh, well, I guess I'll field this one. Um, not and Yes and no. So sometimes um, on um, radiography, it's difficult to distinguish between nodules and, um, uh, granulomas, depending on where the location of that is. Um, if it's on the surface of the skin, it's more often a nodule, um, but a biopsy can definitely differentiate the two, but in reality, they're, they're very similar pathology. So it's a little bit of semantics, um, and not necessarily gonna, gonna matter, um, as far as what to do next. Okay, thank you. Uh, and this is also a question for you, Dr. Lighting. Um, in the images that you showed of uh, the esophagus and the kidneys, how were yeah. these uh, images captured? Was it a CAT scan or an MRI? And can you use um, either one for these purposes? So the ones that I showed actually were um, dye studies. So those are called fluoroscopic studies. It's typically imaging with a dye, you know, somebody swallows a dye or the dye is injected um, intravenously. And then it, the um, expression of the dye is followed. And you, you have to remember the, um, for whoever's asked this question, the technology of performing imaging has greatly improved since the 1980s, which is when those images are from. Um, most commonly we use CAT scans and MRI to um, follow imaging abnormalities in CGD. Um, swallowing studies like you saw for the esophagus can be of utility. Um, and that's often done with, with CT as well. Um, the differences between CT and MRI are that CT provides radiation. So there is some radiation exposure, although there's been lots of effort in the radiation or in the radiology field to limit radiation exposure. And so that's also a lot less than it has been even in years prior. 
MRIs use magnets to look at the image and it just depends on the part of the body that you're trying to look at to, to decide what which study is best. But those are the two that we typically use uh, most commonly. Okay, great. And um, this is also a question for you, Dr. Lighting. Um, mm -hmm. What is the process for a CGD carrier to get tested uh, for carrier status? It's actually very easy. It's just a DHR, just along with what we do to diagnose CGD itself. Um, a DHR can, can show carrier status. Um, okay. it, it could be confirmed with genetic testing to, to see the same um, genetic abnormality that might be present in the family, but, um, but a DHR can do it easily. Okay, great. Um, and this is a question um, for Dr. Marsh. Um, how uh, would one find out more about gene therapy and get enrolled um, in a possible uh, clinical trial? Yeah, so I would say, first of all, go find Dr. Ko's video because it's really good and informative. And then second, I would talk with your transplant physician that you're, or your immunologist that you're interested in gene therapy so that they can help counsel you about would you qualify for one of the studies. Um, you know, and the NIH is a wonderful place and I have tended to send patients there, but there are other sites, they all work together. Um, and so talk with your immunologist and or your transplant physician that you're interested in that option and then seek out, you know, getting an appointment to see if, if you would potentially qualify or not. Sometimes your immunologist or your transplant physician can tell you off the bat whether or not you would qualify. Um, it depends on the type of CGD. It depends what bone marrow options you may or may not have. So starting with your, your local caregiver is the best place. But seek it out if you're interested. Okay, great. Um, those are uh, some of the questions that we had. In addition, we had a question um, as to where uh, we can view this recording. And um, that was um, answered um, by the IDF. It's available on uh, the IDF YouTube channel. And it's also available, this uh, recording can be added to uh, everyone's briefcase, and uh, it can be um, uh, available on this platform, the, the conference platform, until December. And uh, so I, I wanted to ask uh, if there are any more questions for the Q&A, um, because we, we um, have, have a little bit more time. And uh, if not, we can, we can probably close soon, because this has been such a wonderful chat. This has uh, been... Uh, great information as always from uh, Dr. Marsh and Dr. Lighting. We so appreciate your time today uh, for um, everything that you have done for the CGD community, your dedication to us, to, to our patient population. We are, we are so grateful to you. And uh, also we're grateful to the IDF for this opportunity. And if you have any further questions, feel free, please feel free to get in touch with me, Felicia Morton at the CGD Association of America. And uh, I'd also be happy to um, put you in touch with Dr. Lighting uh, and Dr. Marsh who serve on our medical advisory board. Um, well, with that, I wanted to thank everyone for coming to this session um, at the IDF and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. It is lovely to be here today. Thank you, Felicia, for all your hard work, Dr. Lighting as well, and to the IDF. Yep, thank you guys as well. I, thanks for the invite, it was fun. Thank you. Bye guys.